Well, good morning, brothers and sisters from here and around the world. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. My name is Jimmy. I'll be your host and teacher for the morning. And we are in the last of our Sunday, actually, our, our series, God Only Knows, uh, where we're um, asking that question, like, what is God saying to us in the present moment through a number of our regional pastors uh, teaching and speaking locally, like, what has God been saying uh, to them? And then also here on our live stream, we're so glad that you have joined us when you could choose to be anywhere else. You are choosing to be here with us, learning, listening, worshiping, uh, experiencing the presence of God together on this beautiful, sunny, late August Sunday. And my heavens, it is late August. Like, <laughs> this might suck to hear, but September is right around the corner. Now, as a parent with, uh, you know, uh, kids in school, uh, feels like summer has just smoked by, but I know a lot of us are like moving into those um, new rhythms of like, okay, school and lunches and, and new routines. And so we hope that, you know, being part of the meeting house, being part of home churches and different expressions of gathering of Sunday morning of uh, being engaged in compassion will be part of uh, your regular routine. There's a lot of opportunities uh, that are restarting, uh, refreshed routines that are restarting for the fall, and we would love to help you get plugged in, whether it be a home church or in serving in your local community uh, or, or in giving, whatever the case may be, the time is maybe not now, but very soon. So like I said, we're just so glad that you are here with us. Like I just mentioned, uh, giving is one of the ways that we express our gratitude, uh, our thankfulness, um, and our generosity to God for the work of God in the world. And so we're thankful to, to those of you that have chosen to consistently and generously and joyfully give. Um, at, but maybe you're here for the first time. You're like, what does it mean to give to a church even now? Like, what does that money go towards? Well, all of those questions are right down below. You can go to themeetinghouse.com slash give if you have any questions, whether, uh, you know, you're giving for the first time or whether you've had to pause your giving for a while and you're just interested again, like, what does it mean? How does this work? All of that information is right there. I will also make mention of our Discord server. And so if you are a Discorder, I don't even know if that's what it's called, but the link is right here. Go ahead and hop on there and say hi. And even right now, say hi in the chat if you are new, if you are young, old, a long time live streamer or a first time live streamer, welcome each other, say hi, give like a chat high five. And we're just so glad, like I said, that uh, you've chosen to be here. But we're going to jump right into our time of uh, worship through music and then worship through teaching. And then we'll come back here with uh, some parting uh, thoughts and um, enjoy the rest of our Sunday together. So let's uh, turn it over to our, um, our musical worship team. And uh, yeah, let's let's sing together.
makes authentic disciples is not visions, ecstasies, biblical mastery of chapter and verse, or spectacular success in the ministry, but a capacity for faithfulness. Buffeted by the fickle winds of failure, battered by their own unruly emotions, and bruised by rejection and ridicule, authentic disciples have stumbled and frequently fallen, endured lapses and relapses, gotten handcuffed to the flesh pots and wandered into a far country. Yet, they kept coming back to Jesus. Brennan Manning There are only three ways to teach. The first is by example. The second is by example. The third is by example. Albert Schweitzer We must say yes to the gospel. And that yes is manifested in life as lived daily. Or we can say no even by our inactivity. Jacqueline Grant If we buy into the church culture of celebrity, we drift away from following Jesus faithfully. Christopher Ash The show business which is so incorporated into our view of Christian work today has caused us to drift far from our Lord's conception of discipleship. It is instilled in us to think that we have to do exceptional things for God. We have not. We have to be exceptional in ordinary things, to be holy in mean streets, among mean people, surrounded by sordid sinners. That is not learned in five minutes. Oswald Chambers Jesus-shaped spirituality hears Jesus say, believe and repent. But the call that resonates most closely in the heart of a disciple is follow me. The command to follow requires that we take a daily journey in the company of other students. It demands that we be lifelong learners and that we commit to constant growth in spiritual maturity. Discipleship is a call to me, but it is a journey of we. Michael Spencer Discipleship is living a life that we want our children to follow. Vishal Gudis Come, follow me. Jesus Yeah, so good. Discipleship is a call to me, but it's a journey of, of we. Come, follow me. Well, it was the late 90s. I was three quarters of the way through my freshman year at a Christian university. And this, uh, learning and just studying this on my own, um, was making less and less sense. And if I was honest with you, which I probably should be, um, I was ready to pack it in. Uh, you know, I had gone to this Christian university, A, to just kind of get some distance away from like, you know, growing up as a teenager in a pretty specific religious environment and trying to like find out what I thought. Uh, what, I, what I thought was Jesus at the center, but just needing to, to create some distance to sort myself out. And what better place to do that than at a Christian university where I could take courses on studying like who God is and what this book means. But I found, um, as many of us often do, that you can learn things about God without really knowing who God is and how God works and what it means to be a disciple. Now, thanks be to God. Uh, I had a friend who was a little bit more spiritually ahead of me academically, certainly more ahead of me and in age more ahead of me. Uh, and he was such a God send. Uh, the times that, that, that just reading the Bible on my own maybe didn't make sense or created some confusion, uh, Nelson, my buddy, m made sense. Uh, he was one of those people where I could just like sit with him in, his, uh, in, in uh, his dorm room in our residence where I lived as a 19 year old and ask and seek and knock. And Nelson didn't always have the answers, but he, he was just there. Well, welcome to part four of our series. We're wrapping up a God only knows where across all of our regions. We're leaning into that question. What is God saying to us in the present moment? And we're wrapping up this iteration today. And this sermon is uh, affectionately, I've affectionately titled it Discipleship for Dummies. Now I know you're asking, did he just call me a dummy? Yes. 
And I'm calling myself a dummy as well. I know, uh, you know, you didn't realize you were coming to church today to, you know, take on a new title. But here we are. Now, this is really part two of, um, you know, the, the sermon that I taught a few weeks ago call, called the, the Gospel and Tattoos. And if you remember that, um, very simply put, like, what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is that the good news of Jesus uh, with us and for us, loving us and restoring us. Jesus is God with us and for us, loving us and restoring us. And so then it begs the question, good, okay, that is good news. And how do we do the gospel? How do we live it out? How do we become, uh, how do we embody the notion of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus, which sometimes has lost its meaning in our current uh, Christian uh, culture. Like, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Is it, is it just like, you know, on the stairs in your church when you're five or seven years old, which is my story of asking Jesus into your heart and then we're good, we're ticket to heaven, and that's a wrap. Or is it something that's a lot more intimate, a lot more invested, a lot more lifelong, part of a journey as as opposed to uh, a destination? So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to be reading through a good chunk of scripture. And I will admit, and maybe you've read this before, and you're like, okay, it sounds cool, but like, what are, what are we getting at here? Uh, I hope that you'll find, like I have, that this is so deep and rich with meaning and just shows us the goodness of God and Jesus. Oh my goodness. Okay. Matthew 4, more on that later. Matthew 4, uh, starting in verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, so John was sort of the, the predecessor of Jesus, John the Baptist, who had been preparing the way for this, this Messiah, this God made flesh, God here, Emmanuel, God with us, to, to begin his ministry of repentance and conversion and confession, and then also like living this out. Okay, so when John the Baptist, uh, when Jesus had heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way, to the, sea, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people, living, the people there living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, light has dawned. <laughs> From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then if you're following along in your Bible, you'll probably see a heading there that it says the first disciples or Jesus call, the call of the first disciples. Pay attention here, pay attention here. This is so good. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake for their fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Jesus called them. Jesus called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so what? So there's so much happening here. uh, and, And this is the beauty of the illumination of the scripture when we read this and learn it in community. Like what does this have to say? Not just to me as an individual or not just for my like inspirational quote for the day, but what does this have to say to me as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus and in community, this thing that we call the church, the called out ones as we journey together in this discipleship uh, pathway. Now, Jesus is a first century rabbi. Now it's fascinating. Jesus uh, just is always subverting the way of religion. He is always subverting the way of power and he's always subverting the way of like prestige and ego and setting himself or anybody else up for like these, these positions of privilege. Now Jesus goes after the dummies, just like you, just like me the ones who are marginalized, kind of cast aside by the religious establishment or the culture uh, at the time. And Jesus 
persistently goes after them. Now, what is fascinating uh, about that first section that we read is that Jesus actually moves away from Nazareth and moves into the region of Galilee and Capernaum. Now, why is that? Well, the text says it right there. Uh, Jesus is fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy, an ancient prophecy, a message, a message of something new is happening. And he moves into this region that is just rife with like non-Jewish folks, Goyim, brothers and sisters like you and like me who have not grown up with the tradition necessarily, but are just kind of living on the outskirts of society, even geographically. Now, Jesus uh, goes by um, this, this lake, right? He walks down by the lake and he calls these two brothers. And so the first two that we hear that Jesus calls is Simon and Peter and his brother, uh, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they dumped their nets, they ditched their boat and they follow him. And then he goes on from there. He saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee and his brother, John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, an older man probably preparing their nets and Jesus called them. And immediately they ditched the boat, they ditched the nets and they leave everything to follow Jesus. Okay, what is going on here? Now, uh, growing up in Canada, uh, Wayne Gretzky was like a huge hero of mine. I also love football, so like uh, Nick Chubb, who's a running back for the Browns, a uh, big hero of mine. If either of those two dudes like walked in the door right here, and like, yo, Jimmy, come, follow me, let's hang out, let's go grab a coffee or a beverage or something like that, I mean, I would be amped. I'd be excited for sure, but I'd probably be like, hey, I'm kind of in the middle of something here. Can you give me like 20 minutes or so? I don't think I would drop everything just to follow them. And I think this is the, the, like, the, the, the volume shift down in our Western ears that we miss what is going on. Now, Jesus is a first century rabbi, a teacher, and he's moved out to the, from the area of religion to a place where Gentiles, where people living in darkness are. He goes down to a lake, fascinating. No rabbi would ever do this. No rabbi would ever do this. He goes down to a lake and he calls these four gentlemen, one, two, two of which are brothers and they're like working on their nets. Uh, they're casting their nets, trying to catch fish. That, that's their only livelihood. They are the poorest of the poor. To be a fisherman in this economy uh, meant that you were like one of the bottom rungs of society in terms of your wealth, and power, privilege, prestige. Jesus calls them, says, come and follow me, which was the call of a rabbi, call of a rabbi. Now pause right there. In the rabbinic school of thought, there was a process, even in first century Judaism, there was a process through which you learned and were taught. Now, by the age of, like, as a good Jewish girl or, bo or boy, from the age of, like, uh, you know, one to, to five, you would grow up in your parents' household being prepared to learn Torah. And then from the age of five to, like, probably seven or eight, you had the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, uh, the first five books of the Bible memorized, memorized this section of scripture right here, committed to memory. Fascinating. So, after that, you would probably go to synagogue, you would learn the Torah, you would memorize the first five books of the Bible, uh, and then you would like move on. And there would be like a local synagogue leader or rabbi teacher who would like quiz you and they would like test you as to like, how have you grasped the first part of your learning of Torah? Because you believe that God ha has spoken. You believe that God spoke to your forefathers, your parents and their parents and their parents, 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 all the way back down to the lineage of faith. And this, this was really, really important. And so the first part of that learning from age like five to age seven or eight was called Beit uh, Beit Sefer, Beit Sefer, which is house of the book, learning of the book, learning of the book. And then after, you know, age, you know, eight, you would, um, you would be quizzed by the synagogue leader or a rabbi to see like how much you ingested. You'd be, um, you know, subjected to more an intense process of study and understanding and applying the Torah, those first five books. Like how do you apply these to everyday life, to specific situations? Now here's where it gets crazy. After that, so th that process was called Bet Midrash or the house of, uh, of study. And then after that was Bet Talmud, Bet Talmud, which is the house of learning. And so the truly gifted would be invited to or would apply to a rabbi, would apply to a teacher who was like a religious elite person, knew their stuff would, would have had like in our, in our uh, 
Western sensibilities like a, a doctorate. Would have been a brilliant, uh, charismatic, gifted questioner, answerer, uh, and theologian. And so you would apply to a rabbi to learn his yoke to learn his teaching and to follow him. And so you would spend probably about a decade just learning underneath, learning the ways of following this rabbi, this teacher. Now, if you weren't smart enough, if you were one of the dummies, you would be sent off to the trade of your family. And so most, all girls for sure, would have been sent back to the, you know, the care of their mother. And most boys would be sent, uh, would be sent by, uh, sent by the rabbi to go and learn the trade of your family. Go and learn the trade of your father. So that could be, you know, a farmer, um, you know, a carpenter, a fisherman, and a uh, fisherman, and on and on and on it goes. But if you're the best of the best, you stayed with, you learned to teach, you learned to ask, you learned to seek, and you learned to follow. And this is what it meant to be a Talmudan, a, a disciple, a follower of the way, a follower of the way of your rabbi. Now again, Jesus was a first, first century rabbi and did nothing, nothing in the same way as rabbis did at the time. Now what is the first thing that you notice there? Jesus, like I said, moves out of the most religious area at the time, moves down to Capernaum uh, around the Sea of Galilee where all of the Gentiles have been living in darkness, fulfilling this Old Testament prophecy. And then he calls, he, he walks out to the beach. He walks out to the lakeside. This is crazy. This is crazy. No rabbi, we have no other record in religious history of any rabbi doing this. And Jesus goes and he starts to call people who are like in a boat fishing, the lowest rung of society. And Jesus is like, I choose you. I choo choo choose you. And it's fascinating. I think this brings some clarity to why these uh, young teenagers most likely are just like ditching their boats, ditching their father, leaving their nets because they are now hearing the voice of a rabbi saying, actually, I choose you. You made it. I know that like the religious society, the religious culture that you've grown up in has made this very difficult to understand and you've kind of been brushed aside, turned away because you're not smart enough. You've been part of this discipleship process that's convinced you that you're a dummy. No more, no more. I choose you. In every case, Jesus calls the dummies, the castaways. In every case, Jesus invites, as opposed to what was the common tradition of the rabbis at the time, is that you would apply. Jesus actually goes out of his way to seek out disciples, not have disciples apply to him. Jesus takes up the cause and goes looking for the castoffs, including women, including women. Let's stop right there. In all of religious history at the time, in first century Judaism, there's only record of maybe, maybe one other rabbi after Jesus that included women as disciples. And so Jesus is breaking the mold, literally, is breaking the mold and saying, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. women are not part of this. No, I choose them as well. Come and follow me. Come and follow me. So with Jesus, the meaning and method of being a disciple was being subverted to be radically expansive, invested, and inclusive. Intentionally inclusive. In fact, later in John's gospel, so if you uh, head to the right after the book of Matthew, you head to John's gospel, there's this record of Jesus is debating with other uh, religious lawyers, teachers, and they're like, how can you say this? Like, you're offending our sensibilities. These are not the people we choose. And like, who are you to say any of this to us? Where, do, where were you trained? And Jesus says to them point blank, if you hold on to my teaching, this is all that it is. This is all that it is. If you hold on to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Fascinating. Oh, I love this section of scripture. It's so good. Jesus moves intentionally to an area where the religious folks are not. He heads down to the lake to the lake to see where the dummies are learning and, uh, you know, um, uh, walking out the trades of their of their family, of their father. And he invites the lowest of the low, the discipleship dummies to come and follow him, to leave everything behind, knowing that God has chosen them, that God has chosen them, that this rabbi is willing to invest his life into theirs to teach them how to do the gospel to teach them how to be a disciple. And so what makes a disciple then? Very simply, a disciple is one who holds to the teaching of Jesus, who learns, who follows, and who lives out the good news, the gospel. Let me say that again. 
a disciple of Jesus is one who holds to the teaching of Jesus, what Jesus did and spoke and how he, he, he acted it out, who embodies and holds to the teaching of Jesus, who learns, follows, and then lives out the good news, the gospel of Jesus, and invites others to do the same. Okay, great. So that's my intro. <laughs> so what is a disciple today then? What does this mean for us today in a culture where many of us have grown up just like uh, being given the, the, the religious ticket to heaven, just invite Jesus into your heart and that's it. That's a wrap. That's all you have to do. And there's not anything inherently wrong with that necessarily, but if, if that's as far as it goes, if it's just like intellectual, intellectual or philosophical ascent that doesn't get into our guts, our bones, the, the fabric of who we are, we are missing out in, in the discipleship life of Jesus that he continues to invite us into. So what is a disciple today? A disciple today is a learner, a follower, and a liver outer. I know, terrible English. Like I said, discipleship for dummies. A, a learner, an asker, a, a, a follower, a seeker, and a, one who lives out, a, a knocker. Asking, seeking, knocking. Learning, following, and living it out. There's another story that's uh, paired with this one that has been really in some ways haunting, but also just a real gut check of when my own sensibilities, my own ego and my own thirst for um, power, privilege, um, places of privilege uh, run amok. And it's the story of the rich young ruler. And just for the sake of time, uh, I'll inv you'll, be, you'll be turning there and, and studying it a little bit in home church this week. But just for the sake of time, I'm just going to cruise through it really quickly. Mark uh, chapter 10, verses 17 to 27. So this is rich young ruler, Jesus traveling with his disciples, all of these like discipleship dummies who he's, follow, uh, who he's called to follow him. And he's teaching them. He's teaching them the way. He's teaching them the way. This is what God is like. This is what it means to be human. This is what it means to invite others and love others, to change the world, to tell the world, to show the world that God is love and God is here loving you and inviting you to follow him, what it means to be a disciple. And so there's this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and his disciples and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now Jesus, again, I am, imagine him, uh, A, it's a teachable moment, but Jesus is deeply compassionate. Sometimes we read this text if you have before and we think, geez, Jesus is pretty snarky with this guy. Not so, not so. Good teacher, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? And so Jesus turns to this young man uh, who's amassed wealth. So this is likely a dude in his 20s or 30s, a little bit later on in life. He's amassed wealth. He's not a disciple, anything that we know. He's, he's got stuff. So he's either been successful in the trade of his family or his father, but he's coming to Jesus with a question. He's asking, he's asking, what do I have to do to invite Jesus into my heart? Oh. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, why do you call me good? Only one is truly good and that is God. But I tell you, just follow the commands. You know the commands, follow them. And following in this rabbinic tradition, which is likely where uh, this conversation is leading, uh, this guy says, yeah, of course, I've kept all of these uh, since I was a boy. I know the rules. I know the process. I know the system. I've followed it. I'm just asking what more can I get out of this life? So over to you, Jesus. What do you think? And Jesus says, okay, well, there's one thing that you lack. Sell all of your wealth, give away all of your riches, give it to the poor and come and follow me. That's fascinating. What Jesus is saying here is like, yeah, I see you. I actually choose you as well. It's not Jesus like this guy's never going to make it. Instead, Jesus extends again again, to the most unlikely person, especially in this context, the, the call of a rabbi to a potential disciple, come and follow me, live with me, learn from me, uh, take on my teaching, my way, my yoke. Uh, this is a, a lifelong commitment, but there's some stuff that's weighing you down. Sell all that you have, all of this rich stuff, all of these possessions that you've clamored for and amassed and give it away, give it to the poor and then come and follow me. Now, this is the ha haunting part. The text says that the, the man went away sad. 
the man went away sad and Jesus didn't chase after him. Jesus let him go. This is the non-coercive love of Jesus who, who lets, gives us the freedom to choose, but is always choosing us. And then Jesus goes on to talk about the dangers of like money and power and privilege and prestige that weighs you down and pulls you away from the life of being a disciple, from what it means to actually follow Jesus. So this dude had definitely gone through Beit Sefer and probably Midrash, who was be being invited to be uh, a student of Talmud, to be under the authority and teaching this whole new lifestyle change of following a rabbi, and he chooses to not. He, he can't do it. He can't let go of the stuff that is really has him in, in shackles. There's some things that this dude needs to unlearn before he can really learn. It's not just a heart invitation or intellectual philosophical uh, ascent. It's a complete change of living and being. Now imagine, in fact, the, uh, we, again, we, you'll get into it in home church, but the disciples being like, I can't believe it just happened. Like you've got one of the richest of the rich over there coming and like willing to, uh, you know, learn from you. And Jesus offers him this way of being to be a disciple of his. Uh, it's rejected and Jesus, A, doesn't yell at him, judge him, and B, this is a teachable lesson, a reminder, teachable moment, a reminder again to his disciples of like this way, the way of wealth, of power, of privilege, of politics and prestige, the way of religion does not work. It's not what God invites us into. It's not what I've invited you into. This might seem like discipleship for dummies, but God chooses the dummies. God chooses these young men and women who have been cast off. God chooses us, even when we feel like we have been negated, eliminated, cut, cast off, shipped out. God invites us not just to the invitation of the heart, but the invitation of the body, our whole lives being oriented towards following Jesus, living under the teaching, the yoke, embodying the way, mimicking the life of Jesus, because this is what it means to be truly human and to be truly human, loved by God. So for you and for me today, uh, wh what is this? What is it that Jesus invites us into? It's a strange answer, and it's not a satisfying, like, Twitter quotable one, but I think it's beautiful and it's walked out through each of the gospels and the ministry of the apostles and acts and throughout the ministry of, uh, of Paul as, as these, these people changed their lives with the message of Christ, changed their lives. So here it is. What does it mean to be a disciple? To start and to keep going. To start and to keep going. to follow Jesus with, with your heart, with your soul, and with your mind, your heart, your soul, and your mind by asking questions, by seeking answers, and by asking uh, Jesus to lead you, to lead me, to lead us on the journey while we invite others along for the ride as well. Now, maybe you're asking yourself, okay, the first part really hit with me, Jimmy. Like, I don't, I read this book, and I feel more lost than anything. Uh, my suggestion would be just start again. I would suggest read the gospels, read the first like eight chapters of each gospel and then ask Jesus to speak to you. Start, just start somewhere and ask, start and ask. And maybe you've been along for the journey for a little while and you're like, yeah, yeah, I've done that. And, and I think I'm getting a bit like, uh, I still have some more questions. We were never meant to do this alone. This is a communal book. We're, 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 we're embedded in a communal faith. We're always meant to journey together. Like we said in that quote uh, from the beginning, like uh, the, the disciple, discipleship journey is, is a call to me, but it's also a journey of we. Jesus didn't just call like one or, or two. He called like a group, a community together to live this out, to learn from each other and to process together. So start with uh, the gospels. Read the first, uh, you know, five to eight chapters of each gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then ask Jesus to speak to you and then do it with other people. 
And then maybe you're like my buddy Nelson, you're a little bit further ahead on the journey. If you're one of those people, we need you. Who, who are those people around you? Take a look at your, your orbit, your, your circle of friends, the people in your social groups that um, you, know, you travel with most often. Are they just like you? If they are, that's great. Sounds like you have some support, but who are some other people that may, maybe are not as far along in the journey that you could uh, pursue, that you could invite? that you could schedule like a coffee or a dinner or a walk or a beer, uh, you know, with to, to chat through this stuff, to answer questions and to be the practical presence of Jesus for people that are struggling and doubting and wrestling and asking and seeking and knocking. And then finally, maybe, you know, you're at a place like me where you're like, I just, I'm just not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that I can like commit to this. Like, does this mean that my life is gonna change? Yeah, probably. Does this mean that like there's some stuff that I'm gonna have to let go as I orient my whole life towards Jesus? Yeah, probably. There are some, there are some things in life that just cannot come along for the journey. There are some things that hold us back in our human, experiences, uh, human experience of Jesus that just cannot come along for the walk, the ride. So pay attention, even now, to the things that the Spirit is saying, brother, sister, son, daughter. There are some things that you need to unlearn before you learn. There are some things that you need to unhitch from in order to follow. Asking, seeking, knocking. So back to my friend Nelson. I would sit for hours in this dude's uh, dorm room just asking, and there wasn't really... um, I actually can't remember one question that he answered that was just like quotable, where I was like, oh, boom, that's it right there. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And I went off to my cafeteria lunch or my, my next class. Instead, it was just the faithful presence of a wise brother that invited me into his journey, that kind of like pulled me along, that linked arms with me as I processed and invited questions and asking and seeking and knocking together. So brothers and sisters, when you find yourself thinking, I'm just too dumb to understand this, when you find yourself thinking, I just have so many doubts, I don't know that I can get through this. When you find yourself thinking, I've actually pursued a very different way of life. I'm not sure if I can do an about face to repent, to turn around and follow this new way. When you find yourself a little bit clueless, disoriented, confused when you've, when you've uh, you know, grow, grown up in maybe a religious environment that, that's added to the weight. May you know that Jesus invites you, invites you along for the journey. Many of us have invited him into our hearts, but Jesus invites us along for the journey of discipleship to follow him, to come and follow him, to ask, to seek, to knock, He invites us to grow as listeners and followers and learners, disciples of Jesus together. So brothers and sisters, may that be our call together. May we continue to grow as listeners, learners, followers, ones who live out the good news of Jesus and ones who invite others along for the journey. May the gospel, may, may the gospel not just be about the good news for me, but may the gospel be uh, about the, the good news of we, that we are along for the journey together and that Jesus continues to say to us, come and follow me. Grace and peace and much love to you.
so much there. Uh, it, it, it is so good to, to follow Jesus in the highs and the lows, in uh, the deciding and in the doubts. Uh, and, you know, like I just said, um, faith is always embedded in community, in fellowship and connection with God and in fellowship and connection with God's people, with, with us, with the disciples whom he's chosen to come and follow him. Uh, and so we hope that you will make this a we journey, not just a, a me journey, a journey with others. And so we would encourage you, if you've not been part of a home church ever or a hot ever or, or social options like hubs in your local communities, uh, get plugged in. Uh, let's make this a conversation and not just a, a monologue. And so you can go to um, our website, themeetinghouse.com slash home church or visit our Discord server to keep the conversation going. Well, as you continue in your week, may the grace of God, the community of faith that is the church uh, and the inspiration, love and care, gentleness of the spirit go with you as you follow Jesus. Jesus as a called disciple. Grace and peace to you. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and enjoy the rest of your week.